Good morning. Happy Monday to you. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a great day. I was walking this morning and I could hear an owl hooting. And whenever I hear an owl hooting, I just uh, I praise God for his creation. They, they must have incredible vision because they sit up there and uh, they hoot. And if I look in the direction of the owl, they'll oftentimes stop hooting um, because they don't want to be seen. And it's like, how do you even see me? But I think they've got these big eyes and they can see in incredible darkness that we can't even see in. Uh, maybe they even see infrared, who knows? I don't know. But um, it is fascinating to, uh, to listen to the owls and hear the, hear the animals of the morning, which were out this morning. And uh, we had rain. Let's see, what rain did we have? Was it? Yeah, Saturday. Man, did we have rain on Saturday. Apparently, it wasn't much, maybe three-tenths of an inch of rain, but it all came in about 15 minutes. It was incredible rain. So I don't know if you got rain on uh, Saturday or not. We had finished um, putting out, we laid out, we're putting artificial grass in the courtyard. So we laid it all out to look at it uh, and to protect the underneath it from erosion in case it did rain. Well, it rained and uh, kind of messed it up a little bit, but nothing got eroded. So that was good. So we put it all back down again and it's looking really, really good. So hopefully over the next couple of days, we'll kind of trim it and fit it and put the the weight uh, of the silicon sand goes on top of this artificial grass and that's what holds it down. It can't go through um, to get to the, uh, you know, under underneath. So it's just uh, about five tons of sand that holds this grass down. That's probably pretty cool. Um, let's see. And the other thing is, um, I was looking at the COVID stuff and we're definitely in the third wave. Um, but I think we might be over the third wave as far as hospitalizations go. Let's see if I can pull this up. Yeah, here we go. So this is like the peak of the first wave was July 15th. The peak of the second wave was about January 7th. And I kind of think that the peak of the third wave was about... Oh, two weeks ago. Um, we won't know for sure, but uh, that that just seems like uh, we're uh, we're past that third peak. And the the swine flu from 1918 it peaked three times. There was the first wave, and then the second wave, and then the third wave. So we are definitely in the third wave. Um, and after that, then it was done. No more no more swine flu. Of course, the difference between this and swine flu is the variants. And apparently vaccines and variants, I don't know. It is it is so confusing that I just I just don't even know, you know what to think about everything. Do we need a third vaccine? Will there be a fourth wave? Will the variants, will the vaccines work for the original variants? Will they work for the, well, obviously they work for the original variants. Will they work for the new variants? I don't know. Anyway, it's just, it's just more than you can even comprehend. So the best thing to do is just to not get sick. That's all I can that's all I can recommend to you. All right. And as far as birthdays go, we have uh, no birthdays today. Today is the August 30th. There's no birthdays. Uh, we will get together every day this week. That's not um, that's for sure. And uh, I guess that's about it for now. Um, so let's let's go ahead and get into our study. We're in episode 65 of Exodus, God's Great Rescue. We are in chapter uh, 30, 34, and uh, there's 40 chapters. There's only six chapters left to go. Uh, I, th I think there's 40 chapters. That's what's in the back of my head. So, And these next chapters will probably go a little bit quicker because there's going to be some restatement of what's already been said earlier in the book of Exodus. So we've already, you know, we, we had the plagues, we went out, we, we had the stuff, now we're in the tent of meeting, God's giving us all the dimensions of that. He's given us the Ten Commandments, or given the Israelites the Ten Commandments. So it's just kind of a wrap-up of the, of the whole story of the Exodus that, that we're looking at right now. Uh, and then after Exodus, uh, they wander in the wilderness for more years. God gives a few more laws, a few more case laws, um, and then they arrive at the promised land, and that's at the end of Deuteronomy. But we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we'll finish Exodus probably within a week or two. I don't, I don't imagine it'll take much longer than that. 
Um, so uh, let's just go ahead and start reading then where we are, which is in Exodus chapter 34. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I'll write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So just real quickly, remember that God had, with his finger, had done the Ten Commandments. But then when Moses came down out of Mount Sinai and saw the people were, uh, they had made a golden calf and they were worshiping the golden calf, the, the Ten Commandments got smashed. So now uh, God's going to do a new set of Ten Commandments. So he's telling Moses to go up to the mountain, be ready, and we're going to do this again. All right. So then uh, verse 4. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. Verse 6, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. So we've heard this before, but this is this is who God is. He's a just God. He's a, a fierce God, but he's a loving God. He can't allow sin to not go punished, but he also forgives sin. Now, it seems like that's a dichotomy. It's like, which is it, Lord? Are you a, are you a forgiving God or are you a God who punishes sin? And the answer is, he does both. Um, he is slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness. Uh, he does forgive with wickedness, but he also punishes wickedness. So there is some level of punishment, but there's some level of forgiveness that's available. And we know now that the forgiveness that God gives is completely because of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness on the cross, that he became flesh, dwelt among us, redeemed us so that we could be in the presence of God, that we could be in the kingdom. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't punish for sin. And, and it also doesn't mean that um, this is eternal punishment. Sometimes the punishment for sin, as we can see here, he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the third and fourth generation. Sometimes the punishment for sin happens long after the sin has occurred. Um you know, you think you get away with sin, but there's always a punishment for sin, particularly, uh, you know, the, the sins that, um, that have repercussions to them. Sometimes those repercussions last generations. Um, and that's, that's just the, the, you know, on this earth type of punishment. So, for example, oh, you know, what, 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 uh, what would be an example of this? Um, uh, y yeah, you, you, uh, you know, you, you punish, you punish for one generation. It comes to the next generation, the next generation. Um, and I'm, I'm trying drawing a blank of what kind of sin that would be. Um, I guess, you know, like a, like a, a sexual sin or a divorce or, uh, something like that, uh, definitely has repercussions to children and grandchildren, you know, for more generations, um, I I remember, so I think my grandmother's grandfather was a horse thief and was hanged. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, um, and uh, and or maybe it was his brother that was hanged or something like that. But you know, if you're a horse thief and you got hung, uh, you know how do you how do you provide for your family? That definitely that poverty. And particularly from the late 1800s, early 1900s, that kind of poverty uh, is devastating. Everybody lived in poverty, but to have no, you know, to have a one parent household because the husband was killed for horse thievery, um, that would have, that would have long generational type sins. Uh, and so particularly back in the time of Moses, if you did something like that, if you stole or if you killed somebody, that kind of um, punishment would definitely last for generation upon generation, but it's not 
uh, it's not necessarily that God is punishing. It's the society is punishing and the implications, the impact of that would go for generation upon generation. <clears throat> Probably not as much today. We don't really, we don't judge people today as much by their family name and where they came from as much as they did at the time of Moses. Like your family name, which tribe you were, who your father was, who your grandfather was, was very, very important. And it set the stage for what was going to happen to you later on in life. But today, like nobody knows, you know, nobody knows my father. Some people might know my father, but nobody knows my grandfather. I mean, no, nobody knows my, that history very much. It's not as much. But here it does. It was. You would know the history of that family for the generations to come. All right. Moses uh, continues in verse 8. Verse 8. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Now, I'm just going to pause right here. I mean, what's more, uh, what are more, he's already done two wonders in Exodus, right? Not wonder number one is that he rescued them from slavery out of Egypt. Rescu you know, wonder number two is that he brought them through the Red Sea. I guess even red wonder number three is that he fed them manna and quail and gave them water. And I mean, if those aren't incredible wonders, I don't know what are. But he says, I'm going to do more wonders. Um, the mo wonders that are so awesome that the world will see how wonderful I am. So they must be pretty wonderful. Verse 11, obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will snare, they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So, as he drives out these people, the altars are supposed to be smashed, broken down, the stones, everything, the Asherah poles that, that have the gods on them, all that stuff are to be broken down. Not a god is to be left. It is one god, and that is the god of the Israelites. And then don't worship any of their gods. Don't interbreed with any of those people. Don't make treaties with them. Stay pure uh, to me. Once you start intermixing and intermingling with other tribes, you're going to lessen your um, your devotion to me if you start you know having getting intermixed with other tribes stay pure that was one thing that God was very very clear about like this, don't don't exit out of this stay pure now that's interesting because um, today we we intermingle and intermarry and we we like cross pollinization quite a bit. That's called diversity. There's a there's a fair amount of of love for diversity in our current culture, and there's really nothing wrong with that. Um, but well, two things. One is back then it was a problem. God did not want that. He wanted them to stay in this kind of bubble. Uh, but the, the and so Jesus has. You know, redeemed us from all, all sin. We don't have to stay in this bubble anymore. We can spread the gospel throughout all sorts of things. Um, what what God says is that we're salt and light. So the way that the gospel spreads is by that salt and light going into different cultures, and then it it kind of it's like um, yeast, and it leavens the culture, and and then Christianity emerges out of that culture. Uh, that's the way that it's supposed to be done now. So it's quite possible that Christianity can go into any culture and turn into that, you know, turn that culture. That's what happened with the Roman Empire. Once Christianity got its foothold into the Roman Empire, it completely took over the Roman Empire. So that's the way Christianity works. And then what happens uh, is that Christianity gets too sure of itself uh, and it says we are the dominant religion. So uh, the leadership of the religion says everybody must uh, do what we say 
uh, and do as we do, and um, it becomes so dominant that um, you know there's no there's no room to breathe for the for the yeast to continue working, and then it stifles out, and then then you be then you are the outsider again, right? And then you have to start all over again, which is kind of where we're headed in the United States and, and Western Europe, although not completely around the world. There are places in the world where Christianity is new and fresh, uh, and it's growing like gangbusters in those areas. It's just in you know, European Western culture where Christianity has so inbred itself, so embedded itself in the culture that the culture can't even see the benefit of Christianity in the culture. And there's huge benefit. Um, all the things that we support and love, uh, um, joy, uh, freedom, uh, grace, forgiveness, serving other people, all those things are a result of Christianity in the culture. Because it's not natural. <laughs> it's just not natural. All right. Uh, we'll continue on with verse 15. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land, for when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. So, it's saying kind of stay within your tribe for your daughters. Uh, don't prostitute yourself in that area. Don't allow the, the wives of these different cultures to, to change your sons. Um, this is hard because a son might see a daughter from a different culture and a different tribe and fall you know, in love with that person and want to marry that person. And of course, these sons are... Um, you know, their own people, they get to somewhat choose where they're going to marry. But um, God says, no, have to stay within the tribe. Verse 17, do not make any idols. Verse 18, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. So God continues to say, don't forget to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, right? So this, Jesus celebrated this. We even celebrate it to some extent uh, every Sunday when we celebrate the, the reincarnation or the reenactment, reenactment, not reincarnation, the reenactment of the Passover Supper. Uh, but for the Jewish people, they were supposed to do it in the month of Aviv because that's when they came out of Egypt. Um, they celebrate this festival of unleavened bread. Verse 19. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest you must rest. So none of this is new. This is kind of a restatement of all the things that God had told the Israelites previously and were written down in the book of Exodus. And we've gone through this probably a couple times now. These are things that God wants for the people. When they do these things, life will be good for them. If they don't do this, life will go bad for them. And God wants them to do this. Uh, and so he reinstates it. He reinforces it. He, he restates it, I guess you could say. Um, and, and again, he says, six days you shall labor, the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest, you must rest. So this is interesting. Before he said, you must rest when you're building the temple. Uh, he also said, rest on the seventh day because I created the earth and I rested on the seventh day. So this is the third time that I can remember that God is saying to rest. And here he's saying, even during the plowing season, you must rest. And you say, but Lord, I've got crops. If I don't get them out of the ground, they're going to spoil and they're going to die. And I've got to get these crops out of the ground. But God says, no, you must rest. You were created for rest. Man was created. Uh, the Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, this is good for you. You have to put away everything else and you have to have some time resting. Otherwise, it will kill you. And boy, if that isn't applicable to our society today, I don't know what is. Because we're now in a 24-7 society. Getting rest is very, very hard. Getting away from the office, getting away from work is a very difficult thing. And so many people 
want to work 24 7 so they can get ahead you know they get a good reputation and all these different things but god says you must take a rest you can't go full steam all the time it will kill you and it will i have known people like this uh who who work all the time they never stop and rest they never smell and enjoy the beauty of god's creation they never get out and do things um and it, you know, eventually, you know, they may become extremely um, prosperous. Uh, they may be well, very well respected. They may move ahead the corporate ladder very well, very well. But ultimately, uh, you know, who owns the corporate ladder and what are you going to do with all that incredible prestige, wealth, fame, and all that sort of thing, you know, a- a- anyway? Because it's it's all a gift from God to be used in the service of other people. So um, that that's what God calls. And take your rest. Take your rest. Don't work seven days a week. It's wrong. Um, just don't do it. All right. Verse verse twenty two. Celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. So these are the festivals that we're supposed to celebrate, the Israelites are supposed to celebrate, and all the men are supposed to go then three times a year and appear before God. Um, th- this is, uh, you know, we appear before God once a week. Actually, <laughs> we appear before God daily. But back then, at the, when life was really, really tough and you couldn't, then they would stop and they would go and they would appear before God three times a year. Um, verse 25. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. And do not let any of the sacrifice from the Passover festival remain until morning. So it's all supposed to be eaten up. 26. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, these are all, we've seen all of these before. We've discussed them uh, ad infinitum. And God is just restating them. That's all he's doing. Um, Then he goes on, verse 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I've made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets, the words of the covenant, the 10 commandments. So um, this 40 days, 40 days is a time of preparation. It's a time of fasting. It's a time of reflection. 40 days means um, pausing for a long period of time and just reflecting on your life. Um, now, what's interesting, this is, uh, this is an aside, and there's a couple other things here, is that one of the things I'd like to do in my life before I can't is to hike the Arizona Trail. It's 800 miles long. Uh, it goes from one end of Arizona from the south all the way up to the north or from the north down to the south. Uh, it's 800 miles long. And I'm pretty sure I would have no problem hiking about 20 miles a day on average. That would be, um, I've hiked, uh, I, I do a loop periodically where I go out of my house, I go to the Arizona Trail, go up to Colossal Cave, and then come back to my house. That whole loop is 13 miles. And um, I can do that in about three or four hours, uh, really no problem. Of course, it's kind of level. Um, so I think based upon that and based upon uh, there's 24 hours in a day, I'm pretty sure I could hike on average 20 miles a day, which means I could hike the Arizona trail in 40 days, which means that I could have a time of reflection. Now, could I have a time of fasting? Like, could I do the Arizona trail without eating? Well, uh, let's see. Um, I've, I've done the, I, it's, I'd have to have about 15 pounds extra. Uh, and of course, you have to drink, but I'd ha- you'd have to have about 15 pounds uh, extra in order to be able to do that. If Moses was there for 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water, that's, that is an act of God. How can you not go without drinking water for more than three days? Um, but the Lord was there, so the Lord was able to be with Moses 
and help him through this. When Jesus went 40 days, he also went 40 days of fasting. This is a time of fasting. Um, I think I would like to once in my life go 40 days of fasting or hike the Arizona Trail in 40 days in reflection or some combination of the both. Now, the other thing is, is that um, the, uh, the, there's also a thing called a, a fast. It's called a, it's called a day fast. It's where you don't eat or drink during the day, but you do eat or drink at night. That's, uh, it's, uh, it's what the Muslims do in Ramadan when they say they fast for 40 days, which they do, um, they are the, during the month of fasting, whatever, the month of Ramadan. Um, they don't uh, eat or drink during the day, but they do eat or drink during night. So this could also be what Moses does. He doesn't eat or drink during the day, but he eats or drinks, you know, drinks water at night. That, that could be the other way that this happens. Uh, and I think everybody should spend some time, you know, fasting and spend 40 times in preparation just thinking about life. Um, in, in Australia, they have a thing called a walkabout, right? And a walkabout is where you go on this journey and just reflect on life. And, uh, I've thought about how cool that would be to do a walkabout. Um, there's just lots of, there's lots of things, uh, particularly, uh, in our Western culture that we, that we just really, really don't think about, but that many, many cultures and many times in history have realized the incredible benefit and significance of just pausing and stopping and spending 40 days to just reflect. Um, you wouldn't think it is a, it, it, that, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, it, it, incre- it's, it causes incredible disruption to all sorts of things, and it's difficult to plan for and to do, but but it would be, I think it's a time of reflection, of purification, of, of God coming into your life and revealing things that perhaps that he wouldn't reveal if you didn't stop and spend 40 days. So Moses goes up and does this with God. Um, mm. And I think we'll leave it there. I, I, I think we'll leave it there. Um, you know, is, is uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, when people graduate from high school, um, sometimes they'll take a year off before they go off to college. Uh, and sometimes when people graduate from college, sometimes they'll take a year off before they find a job. And sometimes people leave one job and they'll wait a period of time before they find their next job. And I think that those things are healthy, particularly if they're planned to just spend time in prayer and reflection. I think that God can do amazing things there. All right, so uh, I think we'll close it there. And um, would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, thanks for this time together. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you watch over us until we meet again. Keep us in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, again, thanks for joining me. And I hope you have a wonderful day. We will get together every day this week. And uh, Who knows if one will finish Exodus, but it's not going to be long. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye.